on there to Blanche. She said she was a farm girl. When I would go up to see Dolly and Blanche, her mother would be down in the basement and they had ducks and goose all the time. But anyway, I said, where's the girls? And in her broken English or what, she told me they're out, I call it the back 40. And I go out there and Blanche and Dolly, their dad is pulling an old wagon and they are pitching hay. Dolly and Blanche were pitching hay and I can remember that very vividly. It's always in my mind about Dolly and Blanche. Great, okay. Good stories. Um, also, I think it's interesting, um, Blanche Mason, um, married our neighbor's son who was from Montague. And so, uh, and I'm sitting next to Henry, which would have a similar uh, story. So uh, we're uh, the White Lake community versus Montague and Whitehall. And next we'll do uh, Dexter King. Well, I'll tell you, Dexter King was born on the corner of Slocum and Division Street on the southeast corner on the second floor of that building, it still stands, and I lived there till I was three years old. And after I was three years old, my folks decided to get a place of their own, so we moved on up Slocum to Livingston Street and turned right on Livingston and bought the second house on the west side of the street. Frank Stratford was our neighbors on one side and Johnson's were our neighbors on the other side. And it was nice to have Johnson's because they had a Jersey cow. <laughs> and we got two quarts of milk from them every day in the morning and two quarts at night. And the cream would come way up on those blocks. <laughs> I don't know why it wasn't pasteurized. I don't know how come I'm still living. <laughs> but, but you know, I celebrated this year my 97th birthday. <laughs> and I went to start school, well, to begin with, the house that we bought had three bedrooms on the south side and a kitchen, living room, and and a parlor on the north side. And I know today, people don't get a house unless it's got a, a, a heater, and it's got air conditioning, and it's got a nice kitchen that's fully equipped with refrigerator and, and, and all the stuff. We didn't have that. We had a kitchen stove to heat the back part of the house, and we had a hard coal stove that was in the living room. And the hard coal stove took two buckets of hard coal in the morning and two at night. And it burned all night. And it was beautiful. The rays from it was, we always sat there and watched it when we were waiting to go to bed. Anyway, we didn't have any bathroom, so we had an outhouse, three, three whole outhouse in the backyard. <laughs> And we didn't have any place to take our baths, so on Saturday morning we heat the water on the kitchen stove and get the old wash tub out and take our baths in the old wash tub. But I'll tell you, it was a beautiful, beautiful life. Uh, when I was five years old, I went to the high school, and I don't know how many of you remember this high school, but. Uh, I remember it so well because my father and mother both graduated from that school and my sister Doris and Junior and I, grad she graduated in 29, Junior and I graduated in 30, and Bertha graduated in 32. And both of my daughters went there until they tore it down. <laughs> I, I got pictures of, of the tearing the building down. It was built in 1878, and they tore it down in 1960. But I tell you, I had an awful lot of fun in that school. <laughs> and, of course, once in a while we got reprimanded for sliding down the banister. But the reason I guess they tore that building down is the fact that the toilets and, and showers were in the basement, and there were no toilets on the second and third floor. 
But there was a beautiful bell up in the tower, and on, in the morning it rang for one minute when they rang the bell. So if you were getting up late, you better run like mad to be there on time. And I, I, uh, I had teachers that I remember. I remember the teachers that were the toughest. There was double clicked in the second grade, and Franny heard in the fourth grade, and uh, even Norris in the seventh grade. And then we had Mrs. Dodge for English, and she was pretty tough too, but we liked her because she put on many plays at the playhouse that we took part in. And when I got uh, of age to play football, I said to my mother, I weighed 120 pounds, ring and what? And I said to my mother, can I play football? And she said, no, you're too small. I said, can I ask my dad? She says, yes. So I asked my dad, and he said, hell yes. <laughs> So I played football, but I knew in the ninth grade that I probably wouldn't do much playing, but at least I would be there to help scrimmage against the varsity and make them a better team. But uh, I played the rest of three years in high school, and I played baseball, and I played running the track. You know, we were so small that what few of us there was we had to do all these things. There was only 17 in my graduating class. And they built a, a gym to this school in 1924. And the first two years, they wouldn't let me in, the, in to play because I was too small. But I did play when I was a, a junior and a senior. And I, I remember that I was on the all honor team. Wow. So I said, you know, I have so many happy memories of that school. However, the football team, when we went out to practice, we had that field that was east of the school, and it was all sandbirds. You know, we didn't have the nice facilities that they had now. And when we got ready to play, we had to run from this school up to Funnel Field because that's where we played our games. They didn't have a bus to haul us up there. But nevertheless, we had a lot of fun. And when I was uh, 13 years old, my brother and I decided that we wanted to make some money, so we took on the Chronicle Road. He had to sign the papers, and uh, George Koval had to, had to uh, sign for the bond. We had to get a bond in order to get it. And that time, the Muskegon Chronicle was selling for 12 cents a week or 52 cents a month. Now, I like peddling. We had the all of Whitehall down in Spires as uh, Nystrom's Garage. Bunker Hill in Sweden Town, we didn't have until later on. But Junior and I in the summer worked at Pitkins on the popcorn machine. First, first Pitkins had a popcorn machine that sat on Colby Street just outside of the entrance. And then later, it got so that we were so busy that they put a piece of concrete on Mears Avenue and we bought a bigger one that you could get in and sit in, and then we roasted peanuts behind us in the unit and made popcorn faces. But we, we uh, between working for Pitkin's popcorn machine and the Chronicle, Junior and I bought our first car, a 1929 Model A, $600. Oh, I tell you, we had fun. But, but, but you know, uh, when I was growing up, uh, my father worked for Mr. Glazer on Colby Street uh, in the uh, grocery store. And when I was about 
said, six, seven, I used to go downtown on, on the avenue. There was always a, a lot of snow piles on the street. The sidewalks were always shoveled. But on the snow piles in the, in the street were all, always a bunch of sparrows. And my brother and I, we tried to catch them. We didn't have much luck. But Mr. Glazier said to us one day, he said, I'll tell you boys, if you get some salt and put some salt on their tail, you'll get them. Well, we tried it, but that didn't work. <laughs> and I remember uh, we used to hook a ride with a, a farmer going from Whitehall to Monty. We'd take our, our sleds and we'd hook onto them and take a ride to Monty. And then we'd wait and get another one that was coming back to Whitehall. And we'd do that two or three hours. But one day we was all standing on Pitkin's Corner when Merle Whitbeck from Montague came in with his team and he told us that his horses were two years old so they were pretty frisky. But he says, come on kids, get on board. So we all got on the back end of that wagon. He took us up Colby Street up as far as City Hall is now. We slewed around and we came back down. He was going to make Mears Avenue, turn Mears Avenue, and he slewed so I thought he was going right through Pitkin's front window. <laughs> but he took us down to the Mufer Adams Playhouse and swung us around and brought us back to Pitkin's corner. He said, everybody off, that's your ride for today. <laughs> and if, when we, we were old enough to go down to the lake, uh, skiing, or skating, you know, we didn't have those kind of skates that are shoe skates now. The skates we had fastened onto our shoes, and my ankles were always weak, so I was riding on my ankles half of the time. But we'd go down to, to the lake with shovels, and some of the older boys were there too. we shovel a place to skate. And then the older boys would sneak over to the tannery and snitch some bourbon oil barrels and bring them back and line them up. Clark, Clark White, Paige White, and Bob Johnson, see how many of those barrels they could jump. And the, the, the ones, couple of ones that they didn't put in that circle, they set on fire so we had some heat and some light. <laughs> And when they got through skating, they did take those barrels back that they were trying to skate over. So we had a lot of fun. And you know, we didn't run around begging somebody to fix the ice wars. We went down and did it ourselves. And when we wanted to go uh, sledding, we went down to the corners of Sophia and Mears where the Lewis house sits on the corner, and we went down that hill, and if we went belly flopping, we got a good start, and we made the corner at the bottom, but you had to be careful that you didn't run into the depot that sat at the bottom of the hill. We made that corner, and we went about halfway to where the Lake Street went under the railroad tracks, but it was always quite a walk back, you know. Well, so much for that stuff, you know. How many of you do remember the, the minstrel show at the old high school? Well, you know, we put that on three or four years, two nights a week, and we, we made a thousand dollars for the music department. But all of a sudden, the colored people in Muskegon put a big swat in we had to stop. Now, you know, I always admired the colored people because they were always happy, go lucky, dancing, singing, and so forth. And I didn't think we were making fun of them. You know, we were trying to be like them, you know. And, of course, uh, my brother and I took some, uh, took a few uh, things on, on the Thing. I always dressed up as a lady. <laughs> I always dressed up as a lady. 
and, and here I there I was singing, Ma, he's making eyes at me. And, and then this one, I, I, I have a baby. You know? But I'll tell you, we had so much fun on the on the minstrel show. How many how many of you remember the baseball team that played every Sunday afternoon up at Funnel Field? Yep. Well, you know, I, I, I kept a lot of these things uh, as I, I kept uh, to begin with, I kept a, a picture of of uh, Colby Street in 1918, and it just, it, it, you can see, we had a lot of snow during those days. And uh, I and I also kept some, some things that went on at the Newford Adams Playhouse. Florida Bound was put on by Charlie Seeger, and some of you, I'm sure, know the people that were in it because it was probably in the early, or late 30s that these were done. He put on Florida Bound, and he put, put on the Enchanted Garden, and uh, Frank uh, Adams put on the Black Parade. We put it on for two nights, and then we took it to Fremont for one night, and took it to Ludington for one night. And they wanted us to take it to Holland, but the, most of the people were working. So uh, we had to tell them no, we couldn't do it. Here's a smuggler man that was put on by the school in 1921. And I'm sure you people will know a lot of the people that were, were in this. And I have a copy of the Whitehall Community Theater that was 1916, and I'm sure some of you know those people too. And how many of you people know and remember in my old telephone directory? <laughs> Mine was 37W and the pipe garage was 38. And uh, you know, uh, I, those a lot of people had telephones, but they they had them on a on a on a line, so you didn't know you may have had fourteen people on the same line that you had, and uh, when you're in a conversation, you hear the phones pick up. Some of your neighbors want to see what was going on. <laughs> well, I, I kept this telephone directory, and that's 1935. So, you know, a lot of these things are interesting to me, and I don't know if they're interesting to anybody else or not. I even kept a, a thing that was for the, the uh, Wabanigo Jinx down Silver Beach. I, it, it was 1911. So, I have that copy of that. And I remember very well that when Dad built that garage uh, on the corner of Mears, or of uh, Division and Colby, that he had a beautiful room in the front for displaying cars, and then there was a great big place for repair shop that, that you heard Miriam talk about. I worked with her dad there one time. And then they had behind that a nice big room for storing cars. Some of the people in the summertime left their cars here. So it was heated garage. Well, in 1930, about 1932, 33, we had a small orchestra that was started from, from our graduation from school. And so we asked Matt if we couldn't use that front room to have dance. And he said, sure. So we bought a small piano. And my wife-to-be, Marie, sold the tickets. It cost you 10 cents to get in. And sometimes we had 100 people in there. They were all young people. 
and, and some of the Boy Scouts from the Wasp camp come in, and some of the boys that were up here from Lawrence Hall in Chicago, when they were up here, they came to the dance. So every Monday, before the dance on Tuesday, we'd get an airmail letter from Lawrence Hall requesting that we play a certain number for him and to say hello to Florence Esterling and, and to, to say hello to Wickstrom and, and I, I don't remember all the girls. I got I got the letters, but all I got with me was was an envelope. Uh, so, you know, and of course, I also kept some of my stamps. The Russian stamps. I kept some of those, and I kept a picture of the uh, some of the ships that used to bring passengers up from the resorts and they they were down at the station at the bottom of Colby Street there was a little dock insert and I remember that dock so well because I almost lost my younger daughter when she was four four years old she uh, my wife was over across the street from where we lived helping her she was a cripple and Janet and the Peeline boy were playing in the yard. She said, now, don't leave the yard, I'll be right back. And they decided they wanted to go down to Pitkins to see the Christmas tree in the window. So they took off and went down to Pitkins, and when they got to Pitkins, they decided they wanted to go down and see the lake. So they walked down the hill. And on that dock, she was working on it, because it's was slippery, and she fell in. Well, this was the first time they had uh, trailers there, and there was a lady that had just come off the Continental Motors night shift, and she was sweeping off her drive, and the blind boy went over and said, there's a girl fell in the water, and she came over and picked her up, and I can see her yet, carrying her up Main Street, up Colby, and my wife and Mrs. Peeline coming down looking for him. Took her up to Dr. Collier's office and he pumped some of the water out of her, said, take her home. And then he stopped at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And he said, Janet, if you ever do that again, I'm going to paddle your little behind. <laughs> and he never charged me a cent. Not a cent. Well, I think I, I pretty well exhausted my time. Oh, yes. I sang with the barbershop quartet, two of them, in the minstrel show. This was when I sang with Paul, Paul Simonson, Bill Simonson, and Chuck Lipke, and I was singing the lead. And then I sang one with Marty Nyberg and Keith Olds and Wes Weedoff. Of course, they're all gone now. Okay. Dexter, thank you. Um, Dexter has lots of, I can just see, I haven't seen them, but like lots of photographs and things like that. And I would think that if there's someone in the audience who wants to learn more about White Lake history, that they ought to come back and spend some time and maybe uh, take Dexter, uh, et cetera. Also, Dexter, you know, the information on the New for Adams Playhouse, Cindy Beth Davis is in charge of the Playhouse. They've restarted the White Lake Dramatic Club, and they would... I'm sure she would love to talk to you about the Playhouse activity. Uh, there's always more to say. Uh, okay.